afternoon. I am so excited to be here for my first uh, Women in MPN conference, and I'm so grateful to Anne for um, extending the invitation. I tell you, she makes you feel right at home as soon as you meet her in person, so just a real tribute to the person that she is. Um, so my talk is going to be a little bit different, but hopefully you'll find it um, equally as important. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that's become very near and dear to my heart, um, which is the topic of determining value in the MPN treatment journey. Um, so I have a few consultancies to disclose, but none that are related to today's talk. So I shared with some of you in the room and, um, and some of the physicians here that I've had a, a really unique career experience um, in the last 10 years since finishing my fellowship. I actually had what I think is a great opportunity to actually be a community or private practice physician for a while and then um, have since returned back to academia. And um, I wanted to share, so it was really, it start, my interest in this topic really started when I was in private practice and has continued to this day. And so I wanted to start by sharing some quotes, some actual quotes from patients that I have cared for over the last few years that really heightened um, my interest in, um, in tackling this. So one woman said, I know that health is the most important thing to spend your money on. I was just hoping to spend it at least on a, a hoping to spend at least a little on other things. Another woman said, well, we can afford it. We just may have to shorten our vacation this year. These two comments sort of talking about the financial trade-offs that patients have to make sometimes to be able to afford their medications. <laughs> this was a gentleman with an MPN. You didn't tell me I'd be making an extra car payment every month. <laughs> uh, this was a woman who I brought to talk to some medical students. Um, who was sharing her experience with um, trying to get, in char uh, get, uh, get her finances covered. They told me I'd owe $16,500.75. I told them I can cover the 75 cents. The same woman went on to talk more about the stress that she was having, sort of navigating the process of getting the funding she needed. And she was telling these students, you know how you guys can look at your phone and you don't recognize the number and you don't have to answer it. Well, I can't do that anymore. And what she was referring to was the fact that she was afraid she'd miss a phone call from a pharmaceutical grants company or um, one of the financial navigators in her office. And perhaps the most distressing comment I ever got was from a woman who told me, I know you said this drug is better, but you're just gonna have to find something else. And this was a drug that was definitely better and ultimately, despite having gone through all the financial, um, financial processes, she still was not feeling like she could um, afford the medication. So what I want to do today is just highlight the financial and some other quality of life impediments to, that um, impede, impede us to providing optimal hematologic and oncologic care. And I want to discuss the same factors in the realm of how they may impact MPN patients. Um, and then hopefully provide a framework to you all um, who are patients to begin uh, thinking about what value means to you in the context of your MPN treatment. I do want to start with some good news. Overall, in the field of oncology, we are making progress as we've developed lots of good and effective therapies for all different types of oncologic diseases. We are seeing a decrease in the U.S. in our mortality rates over the last few decades. And with that decrease in mortality, we're also seeing a significant increase in the number of cancer survivors who are living in the United States. And this term, cancer survivors, was first coined um, with the idea that it's someone who's gone through a curative therapy for a cancer and then followed for their long-term outcomes. However, now that we've developed such wonderful therapy, or we're developing more um, effective therapies, patients are remaining on medications for longer and longer periods of time. They can live years to even decades, but continue to require treatment and continue to require engagement with their healthcare providers. So more and more cancer in general is becoming a chronic disease. And I think that um, patients with MPNs are sort of the exemplary um, the, the, they exemplify these cancer survivors because most of you hopefully will live many years um, with a 
effective treatment, but you will have to continue to receive treatment and you will have to continue to engage with the healthcare system. Unfortunately, with the longer duration that patients are requiring care, we're also seeing um, very exponential rises in the cost of cancer therapy. Um, this figure here sort of demonstrates that around the mid-2000s or early 2000s, the cost of cancer care started dramatically outpacing both the cost of general health care and the general population as well as the U.S. Um, gross domestic product. Um, for patients with MPNs in, in uh, particular, this was a study that was published in 2022 that looked at the cost of care in patients with myelofibrosis both pre and post their, um, post the six months pre and six months after the time they were diagnosed. And you can see, as highlighted in the darker blue bars, that the cost after that patient has been diagnosed and has begun engaging with their oncologist and receiving treatment substantially increases. And in the bottom, uh, the bottom bar here, you can see that that number um, almost caps to $50,000 in a six month period. Oh, I think there's a, a little problem there, and I'm sorry. But basically what I'm trying to show you is there have been some trends in cancer treatment that um, make this even more impactful to the patient themselves. And that's um, because we have, in the past, what we traditionally did with cancer therapy is we would have patients come in and they would be treated in the clinic, in the infusion center. Um, and now, however, um, and particularly in MPNs, more and more cancer therapies are being developed either as oral medications or as self-administered self injections. And as you may know, um, if you are a patient, these drugs that you give to yourself are actually covered in a much different way by your insurance company than they are, and then those um, treatments that are given in the clinic. And this has resulted in significant co-pays. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. This, is a, this was not happening when I was looking at this this morning, I'm sorry. But basically, what I'm trying to say here is that the co-pays that patients experience are starting to increase over time and they can average about $13,000 um, per year. Um, so not an insignificant amount that patients are being expected to pay out of pocket just to get the health care that they need. So recently, uh, there have been some interesting changes at the governmental level. Uh, many of you may have heard that in 2022, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed with about as bipartisan support as we can get in this day and age. Um, and what we're looking forward to seeing is that in 2025, one of the aspects of this legislation, legislation will dictate that out-of-pocket spending for patients has to be capped at about $2,000 per year. Um, the other benefit is that this will help us spread out or help patients spread out their costs throughout the year as opposed to sort of having this period of good coverage and then facing a large bolus of costs once they've reached their sort of donut hole, as my dad likes to call it. Um, theoretically, it may help at a larger societal, societal level to reduce costs because um, it will allow Medicare to begin negotiating prices with pharmaceutical companies, although some drugs will be accepted from that, including ones that have been improved um, in very recent years, um, which will be important for the cancer population and the MPN population as well. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're sitting back and waiting to see how this is going to how this is going to pan out for patients. Um, I think some people can see some many positives to this, and then there are some people who can actually see how it may, in some ways, have some detrimental effects as well. Um, that's not just a political um, comment. Um, and so we're hoping, though, that overall it's going to lead to great cost savings for patients, and ultimately, if it's successful, may be adopted by commercial payers in the future, at least some aspects of this. So this was legislation that was passed in order to um, target this concept of financial toxicity that's really becoming an epidemic experienced by oncology patients in the U.S. Um, financial toxicity is not just a word that describes how much a patient is actually paying or losing in terms of um, what their cost is, but also has a broader um, it, more broadly encompasses the detrimental effects, all the detrimental effects of the excess financial strain that are caused by a diagnosis, diagnosis of cancer and how it impacts the well-being of patients, their family, and society. And this, this can be a spectrum of experience. 
It could be anywhere from having a great deal of stress, like the patient I told you about earlier, um, as you're trying to navigate through how to get your financial assistance, or it could literally be um, you know, someone filing personal bankruptcy because they can't afford their health care. And we do know there's been data, or there has been data to show that cancer patients are at risk of higher risk of filing bankruptcy than the general population. And not surprisingly, uh, this financial toxicity has been shown to lead to poor outcomes, including decreased well-being, um, reduced quality of life, and that's on top of what patients are already facing from the symptoms of their disease. And this directly contributes to increased mortality. And a large part of that is felt to be due to non-adherence to treatment. It's been shown that 50% of patients will discontinue their treatments if they have out-of-pocket costs over $2,000. And remember, that's around the amount that's gonna be capped by the new Medicare uh, bill. Two-thirds of patients when interviewed said that they, or, sorry, most patients when interviewed said that they would like to discuss these financial issues with their oncologist or their hematologist, but two-thirds of patients admitted that they did not share their financial worries. And more concerning to me is that 70% of oncologists stated that they were reluctant to actually discuss finances with their patients. So this is a figure um, that I borrowed from a, a group of researchers who published a review article on this topic in uh, the Journal of Clinical Oncology um, last year. And I think it does a nice job of sort of highlighting the interrelationship between financial toxicity, which as you'll see in the figure, does not just include cost um, or medical debt, but also includes loss of work productivity, anxiety and stress, um, and then financial trade-offs as well and how that can interact and lead to um, poor outcomes. It also makes an important point of highlighting the social determinants of health play an important role in this as well, and how um, you know, this actually is a contributor to some of the health disparities we do see in this country. Financial toxicity is not the only concept or um, only problem that's sort of chipping away at the value we're providing our patients. Um, there's a new concept that's gonna come to light called time toxicity. Um, as I was listening to Portia talk, it actually made me think about this a little bit um, as she talked about navigating uh, being in college and trying to get her labs drawn and talk to her doctors or communicate, um, getting, your, getting your medications when you're abroad, trying to have that experience. So uh, this is a new concept that's come to uh, light in oncology um, and is defined as time spent in both coordinating care and in seeking uh, care by going to the, your healthcare facility, including the time it takes to travel to your uh, doctor's office or the wait times you have to spend in the waiting room. Um, or just going to get your tests drawn um, when you need them. And I think all of you who are patients can identify that there are a lot of things you'd probably rather be doing during that time that provide more value to your life than actually spending that time uh, in the healthcare system. And so this has become uh, so prevalent and probably uh, a lot due to you know, patients' vocalization of this issue. You know, they're even proposing new metrics to help sort of grade the value of care that we're providing our patients. Things such as the number of days patients get to spend at home during their cancer treatment, or days with or without health care contact. This was proposed in the article that I referenced here, which I think is going to be a really important um, concept as we go forward. Overall, what are we doing um, in, the health, in healthcare and in society to try to reduce financial and time toxicity? Um, well, I will tell you that healthcare systems, particularly those uh, healthcare systems that offer care to oncology patients, cannot do without these days medication assistance programs. Um, in addition, um, most are hiring what we call financial navigators, and many of you have probably interacted with these people. Um, so their job is not only to help you find the resources that you need to get additional coverage if that copay is too large, but also to help you navigate the process of applying for it, which again, another issue with time toxicity, not just the financial toxicity component. There have even been some centers, I think the one that Dr. Mesa is at now, since everybody has to mention him today, um, that's even, that have even published about their, um, their principle of developing financial tumor boards where they bring multidisciplinary uh, teams together to try to figure out the best strategies for patients to get them the support that they need. There's a large push to screen for 
financial toxicity and I would say now time toxicity at clinic visits so that if there is some level of distress, it can be intervened upon early before it sort of snowballs into a real problem. Um, and at the larger level, um, you know, it's, it's patient advocacy groups, as Anne was talking about this morning, or um, patients themselves and healthcare providers that are going to advocate um, with the government that led to the, the medication um, component of the IRA. And um, also that are convincing payers, including Medicare, Medicare first, then other payers, to start strategizing about ways that they could develop um, or focus their reimbursements based on a concept of value-based care. So, so this value-based care uh, terminology, um, from the healthcare perspective or the governmental perspective, is really defined as healthcare that is designed to focus on quality of care, uh, provider performance, and the patient experience. And so I highlighted and underlined that because I want the patients in here to know that you're an important part of helping uh, devise what these models are gonna eventually look, look like. What they're, what they're trying to do is, is conceive of a, a, a re reimbursement method called alternative payment models, where, for example, if you're a myelofibrosis patient, the reimbursement to your healthcare provider is not based on the number of procedures they offer you or the number of visits you have or labs that are drawn. It's more about the overall package of your care and the metrics that are expected to improve not only survival outcomes and medical outcomes, but also quality of life outcomes. Um, and you, know, you always have to say there's a financial outcome here that they're going to be looking at as well. Um, but again, important that patients know that they're going to be an important uh, part of developing these models. Um, at the, at the clinic level, I want, uh, I want you guys to know as patients that there are tools that your physician can use to actually help think about the value of the care that they're recommending to their treatments. Um, I forgot who it was this morning that showed the NCCN guidelines panel, um, but as she mentioned, there is this panel called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, if you're not familiar with it. It's a, a group of experts that meet together and update the newest guidelines in cancer care every year. And um, there is certainly one that is dedicated to the care of uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. And um, basically it's what almost all hematologists and oncologists will reference and need to try to devise what the best strategy for offering treatment is. And given this concern about increased cost, the NCCN panel has actually incorporated something called evidence blocks um, into their treatment recommendations. So if your provider is recommending a certain treatment, they can actually look at this evidence block that will rank the value, the perceived value of a medication or treatment based on its efficacy and safety, what the toxicity is, as well as the quality or rigor of evidence that led to its overall drug approval. And then most importantly for this conversation, an affordability is actually included in this model. And that's not only affordability of the agent itself, but affordability of the supportive care that's gonna be required in order to be able to put patients on these medications. So I would just, I wanted you all to know about these because I think if you, if you really wanna have some in-depth conversations with your providers, you should not hesitate to ask them to take a look at these NCCN um, evidence blocks and sort of walk you through why you know, certain, certain blocks are, are more blue than others. So you can see this one up here that they give as an example. It's not referencing a particular drug, but it's supposedly saying this is a drug that's got good efficacy, you know, four out of five efficacy, good um, safety and tolerability. But if you look down a couple of blocks later, the affordability is only moderate. And so that's just a tool that you can use to kind of have these discussions. But I also think it's very important for patients themselves to have their own model um, to begin thinking about what is valuable to them in their NPN treatment course. Um, and this is gonna change over time. Um, but each time you go into your physician, I would challenge you to think about what is the balance of outcome that you're looking for versus the cost that you're not willing or able to accept and have an open conversation with your provider about that. 
For example, you know, many of the MPN drugs were originally approved because they led to decreases in spleen size and symptom improvement. Is that what's most important to you? Um, how does that balance with the financial cost to you? How does that balance with impacts on uh, quality of life because of potential toxicities, et cetera? And I also want to show you that I did include convenience in the outcome section because I think it's something patients don't talk about enough because it is important for us if we're going to provide you the highest value of care that your quality of life be exceptional as well. And that means you don't spend all your time in the infusion center. It, do, it means you don't spend all your time going to get labs over and over. Um, and you don't spend all your time uh, trying to figure out how to get medication assistance, if that's what's important to you. So I just wanted to end this talk um, by providing some practical tips um, and a challenge at the end. Um, so uh, just to get some advice from the people who are in the trenches helping patients um, to get financial approvals, I reached out to some at Ohio State, I reached out to some in community practice, and wanted to know uh, what their recommendations to patients would be as they kind of go into this process. Um, first of all, we can all agree that purchasing healthcare insurance and having good coverage is important, but they really emphasize the importance of knowing your benefits, knowing your out-of-pocket pocket drug coverage, and being open with that when you go in to see your provider so that it helps aid in that discussion. They really want engagement from you, and they really want, the, we really don't want you to panic when you get that initial bill for $16,500.75, because they said that can be quite shocking and distressing to many people, and I've heard this too from my patients. Come to them, just take a deep breath, come back and realize there are resources, um, many of which um, Ann has mentioned through the advocacy program. Uh, many of the pharmaceutical companies who are represented here have programs for this. Um, and so there are options to get things covered. And most importantly, uh, don't be discouraged by no if you're, if you're um, denied your first application because they will keep working with you. And then finally, um, just a practice tip for me or just a challenge, I would say, is please, please, if you are having financial difficulties or even worries, um, or if you know someone who is, please encourage someone to talk to their physician. Um, I can't tell you what it's meant to me to have those patients be so honest with me. It's why I'm standing here talking to you about this right now. And, um, you know, it has taught me to actually screen for this just by asking, is everything going okay with the co-pays? You feeling good about you know, how this is working out for you financially, and it's made a huge difference. Um, and then finally, just share what you value um, when you're making your treatment decisions. Think back to that model I proposed, which is probably oversimplified, but I think it's just a guide that will help you discuss this with your provider, help your provider get to know you and your goals better, and lead to overall better care. And that is all. Does anyone have any questions? I love this presentation. I do. I mean, I Sorry think it's so critical. Sorry about the technological critical. issues. <laughs> you know, it's so critical in, in that you all know what you're up against and what you, you know, what you can do to make sure that you are not paying that. I mean, you know, there are people that have lost their homes to care for a sick child. And, you know, this is the United States. And so, you know, it's, it's very sad. And so to be equipped with this knowledge is really important. Um, any questions? So um, if anyone can sort of help me through this, because this is a very huge stress for me. My 21-year-old daughter was just diagnosed and knock everything that she does have many years ahead of her. I've already blown through my entire HSA. Um, we're we're looking to saving for our retirement, mm -hmm. and now all I'm thinking about is how we're going to pay to keep her healthy, because I'm not gonna just let her be on her own, and I don't know what her future looks like. So how do you, I feel like my entire financial picture has changed in my life, which I was not prepared for. Um, how do you find out ahead of time what things are gonna cost like, I'm taking her to MD Anderson mm -hmm. um, in a week. Like, when I go for myself and I get a mammogram, they make sure that they call me and they're like, you're out of pocket of 777 Like, you know what I mean? Right. 
I feel like I'm going in blind to all of these things and it really surprises me how little direction or information there is. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I absolutely do, and I'm so sorry to hear that you're going through that, but thank you for sharing. Again, it means so much that patients are willing to be honest about these things, or patients' parents are willing to be honest about these things. Um, I guess, you know, you're absolutely right. With images, and it's funny to me that with imaging and um, certain procedures, that have a certain degree of cost, they always make sure you're pre-approved before you'll even get the image, right? Yeah, um, but then there are others that I don't understand why that doesn't happen. For example, I've sent patients uh, for bone marrow biopsies and then later they get a giant bill for the genetic testing that I send on it and are calling us in a panic because they never expected that. Um, you know, in terms of the advice about going to a center for a second opinion, I mean, definitely going back to that topic about knowing your benefits. I didn't, I didn't, I knew I was running out of time, but I, and I didn't go through every bullet point, but one of the things they mentioned was first, really understanding your network coverage. Um, I was kind of surprised, so I learned a lot from talking to these people. Um, I was really surprised to hear that you can actually look online or look in some, look at your insurance, and it might say that I, as a provider, am covered, but Ohio State healthcare system is not. And of course, that healthcare system is going to be the thing that's really going to bring the cost, right? And so it's very important to know that the healthcare system you're going to is actually covered in your network. Now, if you're going for, I don't know if you've already looked at that, I'm sure you have in some way. Right. So I think you're not, I would empower you, yeah. I would empower you to call back and say, what does that mean? And, and connect me with someone who can really give me the numbers here and what am I looking at? Because I think that happens so often is yeah, we're, we, you, you're told to cover you, you go to the visit, and the next thing you know, just like my bone marrow biopsies, you get a giant like $10,000 bill that you were never expecting, right? Um, and so I would empower you to call them back and say, look, I really need a breakdown of this because, um, you know, you need to be prepared for that. I think it's great that you're seeking that second opinion. And I, um, you know, I encourage people to do that. But I think um, knowing what you're going to have to financially prepare for. And then don't forget, not only are you going to be paying that bill, but you live, you, some of you live in Florida, right? So you're going to be traveling to Texas, right? You're going to be probably taking time off work to travel to Texas, paying for the hotel bills, you know, the gas money of your rental car, et cetera. And so, um, you know, this whole thing is gonna add up. And so um, just calling and making sure that the copay is gonna be reasonable ahead of time. And I think that we should all be able to do that. Yeah. It is, it is. Yeah, hi. I just want to um, just add to this conversation, I, to specifically your comments, because I'm in the thick of it right now, right with you. Um, but so it's interesting. You call the insurance, and they say, what do you guys cover? And they say, well, we don't know. We yeah. need the codes from the doctor. So then you call yeah. the doctor, and you say, well, what? And the doctor's like, I don't do the coding. So yeah, we don't know it all. Don't ever ask right. the doctor. We're, we're completely ignorant. <laughs> right. So the doctors put what they put in. It goes to a different person. The person translates that into codes, mm -hmm. which goes to the insurance. So, so therefore, you have no idea what the codes are for the thing that – and also, maybe the doctor doesn't know what they want to do in that appointment until they actually see you. You know, you see, it's hard to predict what that code is. True. But anyway, with the institution, what I've discovered like literally two weeks ago, the institution that I go to, which is a large institution similar to MD Anderson, within the billing department at the institution, so at the university, there is, um, they have a subset of that billing department that is the estimates department. So I spoke to a billing person and she goes, oh, you need to speak to the estimates people. And I said, okay. Whoever the estimates people, sure, send me that to that person. And they actually, and she was very kind enough to give me um, the number for the estimates department. And the estimates department was like, oh yeah, I can look you up. I can give you an estimate of what this particular, um, you know, what this next visit, because I'm moving to a, a new doctor. And so my first question was, am I going to pay a new patient fee? Because I swear every time I walk through the door, I pay a new patient, you know, whatever. 
Uh, so I wanted to know if it was going to be a return visit versus new patient, and, and also what are these labs going to cost me, and blah, blah, blah. And the estimates people within the billing department were able to give me a lot more information. And this is not with the insurance company, but with the institution. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. Oh, thank you. Give, give it a try. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Excuse That's why I yeah, wanted to bring up this conversation. Yeah, it's yeah. great advice. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to add to the conversation something else that might be helpful. So I see doctors here at Weill Cornell, who we heard from Gail Robos and, and Ellen Ritchie earlier today, and it's an amazing team um, within the leukemia department, but beyond that, the, the hospital, um, so Weill Cornell is within New York Presbyterian, so you again have the clinicians under Weill Cornell, and then you're seen at New York Presbyterian, so the bills are completely messed up. Yep. I found somebody who is act two different people who have been super helpful for me. One is actually uh, a social worker, who I think we really minimize how much a social worker can help you. It's not just with your emotional help. They're navigators, or if they can't help you, they'll, you know, if they're good, <laughs> they'll find somebody to help you navigate billing, et cetera. I had great luck there. Um, and I also found somebody within the institution who was a patient advocate. I don't mean in the traditional sense, but specifically on billing and mm -hmm. financial issues. Exactly. Whatever they call them doesn't matter, but they most major academic institutions, I bet MD Anderson absolutely is all over that. So. We can help you too, great. but this, this is great information. Oh, yeah, on the insurance side, a case manager, that's right. Leslie, that's right. Yeah, there you go. Yep. That's awesome. That's a great point too. Thank you all. Thank you all. Hey, it makes me so happy to hear all the sharing. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, I know. See?